so much for who you are and all you've given so that we can be who we are. Father, I thank you for this beautiful sunny day. I thank you for this place that you provided for us to gather. I thank you for this room full of believers that we can come together and bask in your glory and recognize um, all of the provisions, all of the blessings in this room. Father, I pray for the heavy hearts that are here for the unspoken prayers that you'll touch them today through the message that Sean delivers, through the songs that we sing and through the prayers that we pray. Father, I pray that um, each of us is here to listen to your word and to apply it to our lives, to find a way that we can be your hands and feet, that we can take your love into this community. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. How are we all doing? Not sure what that horrible sound is. We've got some sort of awful buzz coming through this thing. Hey, there it is. How about now? Does that work? That was great. Handheld. Okay. Sounds good to me. We tried. All right. Yeah, that was loud. 
Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, good to see you guys. Uh, happy to, uh, to come with you. You know what? I was thinking this morning as we were worshiping, um, each and every time we come together, um, something unique happens, right? Um, never again will we have the exact same people in the room singing the exact same songs in the exact same way with the exact same experience. And so each and every week that we gather together and worship, it is a unique experience. It is, it is an experience that we will never recreate, never uh, have again. And so that is what makes uh, gathering together in worship of uh, our great God and King so amazing. Um, if you are with us for the first time, uh, thank you for being here, first of all. Um, hopefully, uh, you'll stick around for a, a few weeks. We'll get to know you. Um, if, if you are coming for the first time today, uh, good news, uh, you can get to know all about our church this afternoon at 1 o'clock. Um, we're going to have a, uh, a course called uh, Oikos 101. Um, it is our orientation and membership course. It kind of tells you um, what the church's beliefs are, um, what our vision, our mission, and our values are, and uh, just a little bit about what it means to be um, part uh, of, of this part of the body of Christ and to belong to this um, this body of believers. And so um, if you would like to come to that, uh, we would uh, encourage you to. If you've been here for a little while and you're still kind of um, feeling things out and would like to come, we would love to have you there for that as well. Um, want to remind you of uh, an ongoing uh, home point campaign that we have right now called um, Prayer at Home. It, uh, we have resources back at the Home Point Center, and we also have um, uh, things you can find on the website. I'm not sure what you're pointing at. I'm just going to use this microphone right here. Um, and uh, <laughs> Uh, if you want to go online, you can find all of those things. Uh, to is it cutting in and out? That's yeah. it. A lot. Yeah. A lot. We're just gonna. I'm gonna start getting in a boat uh, down by the lake by my house, and then I'm, I'm gonna sit in the boat, and you guys just sit on the shore, uh, and we'll just do it that way. We'll just go old school with this thing. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, if, if, uh, if you don't have uh, access to uh, any of those home point things, um, we, we pray that you'll uh, go back and, and I would encourage you to go back and, and look at some of the resources we have um, just to make prayer a, a, an avid part of what your um, worship of Jesus looks like and, and your pursuit of him in your life. And so, kiddos, how are we doing? You guys did an amazing job on, uh, on Father Abraham. Uh, not quite as good as I saw uh, two of our elders sitting in the back of the room, uh, Charles and and, uh, and Brad were all over it, and so uh, congratulations, men. Um, you guys are still the reigning champions of, uh, of Father Abraham. Um, today we're going to talk about, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Casey, you're good there, man. You get the third place. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say third. Um, <laughs> Participation. <laughs> Uh, today we're going to talk about pursuing Jesus, and so kiddos, if you have your sermon note sheet, you might notice that the word follow is on there. Um, any of you guys ever play follow the leader? You guys ever do that? It's, it's a pretty self-explanatory game. Uh, the leader does something, and, and as she or he or she does that, right, you follow the lead, and you do what they're doing. Um, we're going to kind of look at that today as we talk about uh, pursuing our leader, Jesus, and, and what it looks like to follow his lead as, uh, as believers. And so um, listen for the word follow as we uh, worship with mom and dad and grandpa and grandma this morning. Um, if I were to ask you what the most common invitational words that Jesus utters, what would those be? Okay, the most often thing that Jesus would say in order to invite somebody to come along, what would he say? Hannah, you got your hand up. Follow me, follow me right? Uh, he says it over and over and over. Come, follow me. Come, follow me. Um, and it's not just doesn't start with Jesus, right? That starts all the way back to the beginning. Um, ever since uh, man and woman uh, sinned against God and, and the, the fall of, of humanity, God has been, has been offering for men and women to come and to follow him. Right? Over and over and over we see this. Uh, this is the, the invitation that he gave to Abraham as he invites him to leave the, the land of his, his uh, father and to, to go to this um, promised land that he says is, is out there. And I, I don't, if, if it's me and, and God says, hey, I got a promised land for you, I'm going to have a couple questions. Uh, probably like, what's this land like? Where is it? Where is it? Does it have Wi-Fi? Like, uh, what's, what's going on in this promised land? Abraham doesn't, though. He hears the, the, the uh, invitation to come and to follow God, and he just goes. 
Uh, and we, we hear the same uh, invitation offered to um, the people in Moses' day as, as Moses and the Israelites are called to come and to follow God out of um, the land of slavery in Egypt and into freedom. Um, and, and they travel through the wilderness. They finally get to a, a promised land where, again, God invites them to come and to follow him, right? And he says, enter into this land and I'm, I'm giving you these commands that you can keep. You can follow me as you're in the land. And we know that over and over and over, they, they fail at that too. And so he sends um, prophets to come and speak to the people of Israel and say, come and follow him. Return to your, to your creator. Come back to the one who has called you to come and to follow him. And finally, as they end up in, in exile even, um, God calls them back. Come and follow me back into this land. Come back to me. Return to the land where um, I had for you to be in relationship with me. We hear this. This term, come and follow, over and over and over until the time that Jesus comes onto the scene in the New Testament. And we hear that, that as the invitation for him to, to offer to people to come and be his disciples. Come and follow me. Um, we, we have to remember that as, as Christians, we're not just adherents to a religious group, right? We are followers of Jesus. And so each and every one of us has been offered the, the, the gift, the invitation to come and to follow after Jesus. And so as we begin our, our second stage of, uh, of our church's strategic plan, um, we, we started that last Sunday. Remember, we kind of transitioned away from, from uh, evangelism. Not that we stopped doing evangelism. Obviously, we're going to continue to reach out. Um, but we're just uh, adding on to that. We're entering into a new area where we're talking about discipleship, about reaching deep into relationship with God. And uh, you might remember that we um, gave you the explanation for, uh, for reaching out um, simply as um, every believer at Oikos, there we go, uh, knows, pursues, and lives increasingly like King Jesus. That this is the, the, the expectation that we are laying out before you over the next three years that we are going to be people who each and every one of us know and pursue and live like our King Jesus. Um, that, that that is what discipleship looks like uh, for us as a body. And so today uh, we're, we're going to talk about pursuing Jesus. We talked about knowing Jesus last week. Um, this week we're going to turn to um, what it looks like to pursue and to follow the Savior that, that invites each and every one of us to come and to follow him. And so um, let me open up with prayer and then we will enter into um, some, some teaching. Father God, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to, to come and worship you in the word. Uh, Lord, as we uh, sit at your feet and we listen to the words that you have inspired through uh, Holy Spirit. Father, we just ask that you would uh, change our hearts, that you would change our minds, that you would help us to repent in walking toward you and every facet of our lives. Um, Father, transform us by the reading of the word, by the um, explanation thereof, and, and Father, in every way, help us to, to pursue and look like our King, Jesus. We love you and we thank you so much for the one who gave his life for us, for, for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible with you and want to uh, join me, uh, open up to John chapter 15. Um, uh, this is uh, during what is called the Upper Room Discourse, uh, just a fancy way of saying this is uh, during what we know as the Last Supper, right? Jesus is in the Upper Room, and he's going to discourse. He's going to give them uh, some instructions, and he, he starts to talk about um, the upcoming things and start to prepare them for uh, what's ahead of them, that he's going to be betrayed, he's going to be arrested, he's going to be crucified, um, and that, that there are some dark days ahead of these disciples. And so he's trying to prepare them for this. And as he talks to them, uh, we, we see a few things happen in, in the course of this, this meal, right? He, he uh, initiates communion, and he, he gives them this picture of, of what they are supposed to do in remembrance of the one who's giving his body and blood for them. He, he talks to them about um, uh, this, this, uh, um, this service that he's calling them into, and he, he cleans their feet in order to, to show them what it looks like to serve one another. Uh, and, and then uh, one of the other things that we see there is that he gives this pretty memorable um, explanation of what it looks like to pursue him, what it looks like to be in relationship with Jesus. And we find this in John chapter 15. Uh, we're going to start in verse 1, if you have that open. Uh, he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and also I remain in you. 
No branch can, be, can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. You might notice that the, the word um, remain, it, it appears over and over and over in this um, in, in these passages, uh, it is the word "meno" in Greek, and it just means to abide in, or remain, or connect, or dwell within. It's it's to make yourself at home within um, what whatever's being talked about. And so Jesus is telling them over and over and over, "Remain in me." Uh, verse five, continuing, he says, "I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain, abide, make yourself at home at uh, in me, and I in you." You will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If, if you do not remain in me, you are like branch, a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is uh, to my Father's glory that you would bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And so the metaphor that Jesus is giving here is for that of a, a branch and a vine, right? Uh, the branch has its, has its strength, has its vitality, has its life that comes from the vine. And so he's, he's asking us to abide in him, to remain in him in the same way that a, a branch is only going to be fruitful when it's connected to the vine. And he says this is the way that we are to pursue him um, and connect to him in relationship. That our relationship with Jesus is rooted in our willingness to ground ourselves and, and make ourselves at home within the presence of Jesus. Um, this doesn't mean that, uh, that we don't uh, we hold ourselves off in a, a cabin somewhere and, and, or join a monastery, right? He's, he's, he's saying, listen, um, in everything that we do, we need to learn to be at two places at once, right? And so um, whether you are at the bank, right? Um, you're at the bank and you're at home with Jesus. Or, or whether you're at the hospital, uh, you're at the hospital and you're at home with Jesus. Whether you're at a construction site, you're at the construction site and you're at home in the presence of Jesus. Everyone is at two places at once, whether you're in the office or you're at school or you're checking email or you're pursuing um, uh, pleasure and joy and, and, and you're at play. Um, you are also at home in the Lord. It's, it's this idea of practicing the presence, uh, of being um, in the presence of Jesus. Um, he calls us to abide or to remain in him. We, we see the same language kind of spoken by Paul as he talks about um, praying without ending, without ceasing, right? Praying consistently and constantly, 24-7 communion and communication with the one who has, has bought us at a price. He is divine, and we are the branches, and so we need to pursue relationship no matter what else is going on in our lives. At all points in time, we are filling ourselves and our thoughts with the Lord. This is the idea of, of Christian meditation, right? It's not emptying ourselves like Eastern meditation. It's filling ourselves and our thoughts with the things of, of God. And there was a, a medieval uh, monk um, at a monastery um, who, who was really not even a monk. He was a dishwasher at this monastery, uh, and his name was Nicholas. And, and he, he was uh, called to practice the presence of God. Um, and uh, if you have never heard of the name Brother Lawrence, that's who I'm talking about, right? This man named Nicholas, when he went into a monastery, he took the name Lawrence of the Resurrection. And then he was called Brother Lawrence. And, and he was a, a 17th century uh, French layman who worked at a monastery in the kitchen. And, and as he did this, um, he made it his life's ambition to, to practice the presence of, of God, to, to just be in the presence of God no matter what else was going on in his life. And, and he, he uh, spawned a very popular book called Practicing the Presence of God. And, and in this, this book, it just kind of records some of his, his um, letters that he conversed with other people or um, conversations that he recorded about, about doing just that, practicing the presence of God of God. And one of the most famous quotes from, from that book, uh, from Brother Lawrence, is this. He says that abiding in Jesus is, is this way. It's, uh, the time of business does not, with me, differ from the time of prayer. And in the noise and clatter of my kitchen, while several persons are at the same time calling for different things, I possess God in his great tranquility as if I were upon my knees before the blessed sacrament. And, and, and when he talks about the Blessed Sacrament, that probably needs a little bit of explanation. Um, at that time, there was something called um, Eucharist adoration. 
And this was uh, the idea that um, because the, the uh, Catholics at that time and, and still today um, think that the body of, of, of Jesus is actually present in the, the communion meal, um, they would actually have what they called Eucharist adoration. And they would set the, the emblems, the bread and the wine out on, a, on an altar. And it would sit out for 40 hours before uh, the communion meal. And, and at that point in time, you could come and you could be in the presence of Jesus in their mind. Uh, you would you would come and you would you would worship at this at this altar that had these emblems uh, upon it, uh, and and uh, as this happened, he says, "Listen, when I'm in my kitchen, it's it's just as if I was right there in in, in the presence of the body of of Christ displayed in on that altar. Um, it's it's the exact same when I'm in my kitchen, and and several things are going on. People are shouting all of these different things." There's the clanking and, and chatter of, of plates and, and dishes and pots and pans and everything is going on. I am in as much tranquility right there and then as I am when I'm sitting before the blessed sacrament. And so he's, he's giving us this picture of what it looks like for him to sit in this, this uh, presence of Jesus no matter what is going on around him. I was, I was thinking about this this week as, as I thought about the, our communion meal and how different it is for us. Like 500 years later in America, um, it's, it's like polar opposites from what uh, he was talking about in that moment. You just consider the, the difference between um, 40 hours of preparation for a communion meal and the way that we, um, in a moment, get a prepackaged you know, uh, wafer and, and juice and we, we you know, tear it open and we, we have this. I mean, there's no there's no time for like a deep reflection or a deep consideration of what is going on in this meal and in the moment that we are remembering the one who's given his life for us. Um, this morning, I want to invite up Kyle. He's going to lead us into a time of um, of communion of, of the Lord's Supper. And as we do this, um, I just want to challenge you to to slow down this morning and to think about what it is that we are are taking. Um, as we take these emblems that represent the body and the blood of the one who gave himself for us. And so... As John just mentioned, uh, things have changed greatly uh, in the past uh, with, as far as it goes to communion. However, we must be cautious that we do not let the meaning also change with that. We're likely familiar with the first part of the Lord's Supper instructions that Paul wrote about in the, to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 11. Many times we stop reading at verse 25, but it is important that we continue on reading past that verse to what follows. That may be the most important part, to be honest. While Paul was addressing the Corinthian church at the day, it is still applicable today. So I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 29, and then we're going to dig a little deeper into the last verses. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord on the night he was betrayed took the bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which for you do in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be, guarantee, will be guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. So that's the whole passage. Now let's focus on verses 26 through 29, which I believe pack an important meaning that we often forget. So verse 26 again says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So if we break that down a little bit, the word proclaim here is the same word translated as preach in other places in the Bible. So when we take communion, we are preaching a sermon to God himself and to everyone who sees us take that communion. With this information, what sermon will you preach today? Communion is a time of remembrance, looking back at what Jesus did for each of us on the cross, but it is also a time to look forward to when Jesus returns. We see the looking forward portion uh, in Matthew 26, verse 29. Jesus says, I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew in my Father, with you in my Father's kingdom. You see, Jesus is looking forward to having communion with us in heaven when we get there. In verse 27, it reads as this, Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks of the cup 
of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body of the blood of the Lord. So this is a warning. The Lord's Supper must be treated with reverence and practice in a spirit of self-examination. This can be easily be misunderstood. It doesn't mean that if someone has sin in their lives, they can't come and remember what Jesus has done for them, because who needs it more than them? What it means is we need to repent of those sins and turn them over to him. If we don't, we are in a way minimizing what the price, the price that Jesus paid on the cross. And the last two verses, 28 and 29, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment on themselves. So we need to examine ourselves. Jesus forgives. If we don't, if we don't judge ourselves, the Lord will judge us. We must remember that Jesus paid the price for every sin and will not hold them against us. However, if we don't turn them over to him, then we bear that ourselves, which is a price we don't want to pay. So remember these points when we take communion. First, we must, we must take the Lord's Supper respectfully, or thoughtfully because, he, uh, because we are claiming what Jesus died, that Jesus died for our sins. Second, we must ensure we are worthy with reverence and respect. And third, we must examine ourselves of the unconfessed sin and resentful attitudes that we may harbor. So I'm going to pray for us, and then please slow down. Just as Sean said, slow down and reflect. We've added time following the prayer for each person to do that time of reflection and, have, and make sure that you're personally ready to take the Lord's Supper using these verses that we just went through as a guide. So please use it. There is no hurry. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift that you've given us, the forgiveness that you have opened up to each of us, if we just ask for it, Lord. We just ask that you lay upon our hearts all of those things we need to turn over to you uh, today, and that we know that you are the King of Kings, and you can bear all that. And your Son came forward and, and took those sins from us, Lord. Help us not to, to carry those sins ourselves or to attempt to carry those sins ourselves. Again, we thank you for providing this avenue in which we can do that. We just ask that you speak to each person here today uh, through this time of meditation and communion, uh, that they will see clearly uh, the direction that they need to head toward you. Uh, we want to do that uh, to the furtherance of your kingdom. We just ask these things in your name. Amen.
So again, the <clears throat> words of, of Brother Lawrence, um, the time of business does not with me differ from the time of prayer. And in the noise and clatter of my kitchen, while several persons are at the same time calling for different things, I possess God in as great tranquility as if I were on my knees before the blessed sacrament. Imagine for a moment just the, the, the peace and the joy and, and the, the, um, the feelings that would be expressed if, if every moment of your day, no matter what was going on, no matter how hectic things around you were, um, you, you had the same calm that you had in just the few moments that we were taking communion a moment ago. Um, that is what Brother Lawrence is, is talking about, this, this reveling in God that, that produces a, a sense of just peace in him, no matter what is going on around him, the, the tranquility that comes from just meditating upon the king of creation who has given us uh, the right to be called his. Um, I'm guessing I'm not alone in, in craving that kind of uh, relationship. Uh, he, he called this practicing the presence of God, which means it takes practice, right? And, and we know with, with anything that takes practice, the more that you practice it, it gets easier, right? Uh, and, and so that's what we're going to look at this morning. The reason that, that Brother Lawrence could, could boast uh, that he had this kind of peace in his life was because he had devoted his life to finding that kind of peace, no matter what was going on, of practicing the presence. Um, he made this his, his practice, and he kept pursuing the presence of God and everything that was going on around him, no matter how much chaos or commotion or distraction that we live in, we can do the same thing today. Um, God's grace is no less uh, available to us today than it was in the 1600s. Um, and so we can practice the presence of God. Uh, William Paulsell, uh, he describes it this way. He says, it's unlikely that we will deepen our relationship with God in a casual or haphazard manner. There will be a need for some intentional commitment, some reorganization in our own lives, but there is nothing that will enrich our lives more than a deeper, clearer perception of God's presence in the routine of daily living. I could not agree more with that sentiment. Um, there is nothing, there's no self-help uh, book that you're going to read, there's no technique that you're going to learn through a podcast, there's no level of income that you're going to achieve, there's no relationship that you're going to experience, there's nothing in your life that will enrich your life the way that a, a deeper, clearer perception of God's presence in the routine of daily life will. Um, and, and that's what we want to do in pursuing Jesus together. Um, you know why we read our Bibles? I mean, it's not simply for the sake of saying, hey, I've read the thing, right? It's not, it's not simply to, to, to fill our heads with knowledge, although that's part of what happens, right? We, we read our Bible so that we will pursue Jesus. Um, why do we pray? So we can pursue Jesus. Why do we gather so that we together pursue Jesus? Why do we serve in pursuit of Jesus? Why do we give? We give to pursue Jesus. Jesus in this community as followers of Jesus our entire lives are for the the purpose of pursuing Jesus we, we want to be with Jesus more than we want anything else we want to remain in him abide in him in the same way that he instructed us in John 15 uh, we talk about uh, a, a lot knowing Jesus. We talk a lot about being like Jesus, but, but I think we forget the, the middle part there of pursuing him. Um, the way that, that, that knowing him and living like him is, is made real in our lives through our pursuit of the one who has made that known to us. And so uh, if, if there's nothing else that you get from the balance of today, I want you to get this one statement, and that is this. Um, we don't grow into pursuing Jesus. We grow out of pursuing Jesus. Right? You, don't, you don't have to clean up, you don't have to get ready, you don't have to get right before you can pursue Jesus. It's actually those pursuing Jesus that, that experience uh, him cleaning us up, him getting us right, him, him doing those things in our lives. Discipleship is pursuing and following Jesus. It's the, the choice of apprenticeship to Jesus. All right? in, the, in the same way that, that if you and I wanted to become a tradesman, um, we might pick out somebody who we saw, who we knew had it down, and we would follow them around. 
and we would learn from them and we would watch everything that they do and we would see the way that they think through each and every situation and we would try to learn the, the tips and the techniques and the, the, the tricks for how to um, take on that, that trade and, and we would learn from them the way that we should do what they do and, and after watching them for enough time, what they do becomes what we do instinctively and that's what it looks like to, to pursue them in, in apprenticeship. And, and Jesus is the expert when it comes to godly humanity, right? Because he was, he was fully God and he was fully human. So no one's going to represent uh, godly humanity better than Jesus did. And so if we want to, to be like Jesus, then we need to apprentice Jesus. We need to pursue him in our lives. We need to follow him and see just how it was that he went about all of the things that he did and the way of living that, that he um, gave to us so that we can ex instinctively do the things that Jesus did. Um, but don't take my word for it. Let me show you that from Scripture. Um, if you will, turn with me to Luke chapter 5. If you have that um, in your Bible there, uh, turn, uh, if you have a, an app with a, uh, uh, the Bible on it, uh, Luke chapter 5 is where we're going to be. This is in, in a portion of, of Jesus' ministry where he is he's beginning his public ministry. He is starting to preach and he's starting to draw a crowd. And as he draws this crowd, he's teaching them. And Luke explains it this way, starting in verse 1 of Luke 5. He says, One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. So Jesus is teaching this large crowd of people, and he, he uh, sees these, these two boats that are sitting there, and some fishermen that are uh, cleaning their nets. These fishermen have been out all night trying to fish, and they haven't been successful at all. We'll find that out here in just a, a few moments. But but they're they're back uh, on the shore now, and they're cleaning out their no, their nets from a, a a poor night of fishing, and they're frustrated, I'm sure. And it's at this point that Jesus goes to them, and in, in verse three it says Jesus got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore, and they sat down and taught the people from the boat. Um, this would be a, a good way to keep the crowd from pressing in on him, right? And, and to be able to address the whole crowd. And so he, he gets out a little bit away from the shore, and he's on this boat, and he's preaching. And it's almost like it's, it's an amphitheater where the, the sound can bounce off the, the, the face of the water and get to the people. And, and you know, it, it works out really well. Uh, verse 4, uh, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and have not caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. You can almost hear like the, the, the frustration in his voice as he's giving Jesus this, this picture of, of just the, the futility of, of what he's asking them to do. This isn't going to work. We've been doing this all night. Uh, but because you say so, we'll, we'll do it. Verse 6, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And so they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come out and help them. And they came out and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Just think about the picture of what is going on in this scene. Um, the, these professional fishermen who have been out all night trying to catch fish, they've had no success at all. They come back in, they're, they're you know, cleaning their nets, done for the day. And, and all of a sudden, Jesus tells them, hey, put out for the deep water, boys. We're, we're going to catch some fish. And, and they say, listen, this isn't going to happen, but just because you say so, we'll go along with it, Jesus. We'll throw our nets down. We'll show you. And, and as they pull them up, time and time again, they're just getting these loads of, of fish. If, if you would have asked these guys at the beginning of the night, like, hey, guys, you know, what are you guys going out to fish for? And they're like, man, we want to catch so many fish that it would, it would just about sink our boats, right? Uh, and now they're in that situation where they have now caught so many fish that their boats are starting to, to you know, sit a little too low in the water. They're a little afraid for, for getting these fish back to the, 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 the shore. And, and they catch that kind of a boatload of fish. And, and, and at a time of day when, when that seems like an impossibility, that's not when you go out fishing. You go out fishing at night when it's cool and, and they don't have the sun. And, and you know, everything that's, that's against the idea of bringing in all of these fish isn't working against you. And yet... It's at that point um, that, that they catch all of these fish. And, and watch Peter's response here, because it's not elation. You would think that he would be so excited about that, because he's getting exactly what he asked for, right? Like, that's what they went out to do, was to catch fish. Jesus has given them this huge catch of fish. But Peter's reaction here is fear. Watch this, verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. 
I am a sinful man. Um, he sees something in this situation that is, that is waking him up to the fact that, that this isn't just a, a normal guy. The, 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 the Jesus that's standing here before him, and, and there's something going on with him that, that he realizes in himself that there's something missing from his own life. And let me just turn that scene on you for just a, a moment. Um, what about you? If, if I were to ask you, um, what is it that, that if I gave you would give you all of the satisfaction, all of the fulfillment that your life requires? What, what would that be? What, what is the one thing that you're just missing from your life that if I gave that to you, you would say, that's it, life's complete. Uh, a, new, a new car, a new house, a new job, um, a spouse, a child. Like what, what, is, the, what is the thing, uh, every penny that you ever need, every, every ounce of success that you could ever draw out of life, every accomplishment, every achievement, every acknowledgement that you desire, if I gave you all of that right now, you know what you'd find out really quickly? It's all a lie. <laughs> that, that everything that we desire, that's the, the, the dirty little secret of our desires, right? That even if you had everything that you desire, it wouldn't be enough. Because um, then you just desire something else. Your desires would change. Your attitude would change. Because you weren't designed for stuff. You weren't designed for a situation. You were designed for a relationship with your creator through Jesus Christ. And so it's, it's his life uh, and, and living with him in his kingdom that we were made for. Look at verse 9. He says, um, for he and his, all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so, so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. And so they pulled their boats up to the shore, left everything, and followed him. When we think about pursuing Jesus, it sounds good on paper. Like It sounds like, yeah, I, I want to do that. But, but when it comes to our actual lives, there are so many things that just keep us from doing it as we know we ought to do it. Um, we're indecisive, right? We, we think, I want to, but am I really ready? Um, we, we're, we're busy. Like, where am I going to fit that in my schedule? I, I, I've got so much going on. We're, we're distracted, right? We, we get home and we get back into everything that we have going on. We come back next week and we're like, oh yeah, I meant to do that. Um, we're inconvenienced sometimes, right? We just think to ourselves, I'm, I'm tired and that makes me uncomfortable and I just don't even know if I want to do it. Um, and, and listen, if that describes you, um, that's not something to be identified and laughed off. It's actually something that needs to be repented of. Um, it's something that we need to identify in our own lives and say, man, I, I got to turn from that. I want to turn that over to God and say, God, make me different in this area. We need to follow Jesus as we should. You are never going to pursue Jesus by, by waiting until you're ready, by waiting until you've cleared your schedule, by waiting until you're focused and you're comfortable. It's just never going to happen that way. Much like the disciples, we need to drop those things and we need to follow after Jesus. And I want you to notice where the disciples are when he performs this, this miracle. Simon and Andrew... James and John, they've been out all night. They've caught nothing, right? Uh, they're, they're frustrated, and then they're in the middle of a complete failure, and enter Jesus, and he says, hey, boys, let's put out the deep water. Let's, let's go out and see if we can't catch you guys with fish. And they end up with this, this giant haul of fish. Jesus gives them everything that they thought they desired, um, this, this unavoidable sign of his worth in their life, this mir miraculous sign that he is worthy of every bit of their trust. And has Jesus done any less for any one of us? That, that he's given his life in our place to bring us from life, from death to life, right? From, from sin and death and the devil to, to life and relationship with God, the way that we were created to be. He has done so much. How can we turn and not pursue him? And so as the, as the disciples are, are given this, this invitation, come and follow me, what do they do? They leave everything behind, and, and they follow Jesus. You know what's harder than leaving everything and following Jesus? <coughs> Keeping everything and following Jesus, right? Um, that, that, I've heard it said before that, that dying for Jesus is easy because it, it takes one moment of faithfulness. <coughs> Living for Jesus is hard because it takes a lifetime of faithfulness. And that's what pursuing Jesus looks like. If we are going to enter a season in which we are reaching deep to know and to pursue and to live like Jesus, 
I want you to know that, that and to be reminded of, of this is only going to happen in abiding deeply in him. A remaining connected to the source of all of, all of life. By, by connecting to the one who is the author of life, who came into the story in order to, to build relationship with the people that he had created for just that reason. Um, listen, if, if you think you can't do this, you're wrong. And if you think you can do this, you're wrong. <laughs> because it's not on, on the basis of, of what you can or cannot do that, that God makes this relationship with each and every one of us. It's, it's on the basis of what Jesus has done and, and did in your place for your sins that he connects with you. And he is the starting point for all of our faith. He has done everything required, and he has performed the miracle of bringing life from death. We don't grow into pursuing Jesus. We grow out of pursuing Jesus. Father, that's where we are this morning. Uh, Lord, talking about and, and dwelling upon pursuing your son and, and what he's done for us. Father, as we, as we come to this, uh, this moment and and thinking through where we are in our walk with you, Father, my prayer for each and every one of us, my prayer for my own life is that, that we are, are putting away all of the distractions. Father, we're putting away all of the inconveniences, all of the busyness, all of the, the things that would take us away from following after your son as we ought. And Father, we would, we would sincerely pursue the one who has pursued us. Um, Father, that we would become apprentice disciples of Jesus, following after him. Uh, Lord, as we as we come and and confess where we're, where where we sin and we fall short this morning, Lord, I just ask that in each and every person in this room, uh, Father, we would we would turn those things over to Your Son. That we would um, see this as another opportunity to to plant our flag in the ground so that we might follow after Jesus as we ought. Um, Lord, we love you and we thank you for the presence that you have given us in the Holy Spirit, for the fact that each and every one of us who are believers have your presence in our lives every single day, every single moment of that day. Um, Father, that we can trust in who you are and, and what you have done to purchase us uh, and given us your Holy Spirit, the down payment for everything that will flow as we come into the inheritance of your great kingdom. Father, as we enter into a time of just reflecting and responding to who you are in our lives, Father, I just ask that each and every one of us would genuinely pursue you with our lives. That we would dwell richly in the word. That we would, we would abide in the vine who is, is giving us all of the fruitfulness in our lives. That, that Father, in everything that we do, we look to your Son as our salvation and our sanctification. Father, we thank you so much for what you've done in us, what you're doing through us, what you will do among us in Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Will you stand with me? We have a, a song of reflection and response, a moment for us to again remember the one who's given himself for us. And maybe you're here this morning and you have never accepted Christ. I would love for you to come forward and and we have the baptismal right here uh, we'll we'll dip you down in it we'll bring you back out of it um buried with christ for all of eternity raised to newness of life ready to do everything that he's put in front of you um, for everyone who's here though um, we have this opportunity to again say i want to pursue jesus in my life um get connected with a, a family group get connected with um people who will who will help you in that pursuit and chase after Jesus as the option. Whatever the decision this morning is, don't put it off for another time. Don't put it off for another day. Don't put it off for another hour. Take care of it now. Let's sing.
start with one we don't have a slide for, and that way I won't forget it, Miss Crystal. Um, she reminded me this morning, next Sunday here at the church for junior high, high school, college age, we're going to have a Super Bowl party. Did I get that right? I'm not sure exactly what time, but there will be an event created on our Facebook page. Um, so Gage will either leave extremely happy or very despondent. We'll see how the Chiefs do, but, but his mood will depend on that. Anyway, come and have fun, have some fellowship, and enjoy it. Um, next, I want to talk about giving. Um, we have several ways to give. Um, we have the basket in the back. We have Venmo. We have Tidely. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about, it's my, it's my first week this month where I'm doing the announcement. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a personal story. But first, I want to read from God's Word. This is Proverbs 3, uh, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. So, I was raised in church, and I was taught that I should, I should give back to God what belongs to God. And then I reached a point in my life where I felt like I couldn't afford to give back to God what belonged to God. Um, Kim and I were married. We were very young. She was going to school, and I was working tons of hours to just keep the lights on, to be honest with you. And that became my priority. Um, I paid my bills first. And if I had anything left... That's what I gave to God, and it became a, a point where I didn't feel like I had anything left because that bill was coming again next month. And it got to the point where I didn't give anything back to God. Um, I appreciated what he gave me, but I kept everything I earned because we needed it to keep the lights on, or so we thought. As time passed, like I said, I was raised to give, and I knew I was supposed to. So when the plate went past, or the basket in the back, I put in a five or a 20, but I was reluctant to do it. Um, this is how old I am, how long ago it was. When I would drop that 20 in there, I thought, there's three days worth of groceries or half a tank of gas. I didn't think, this is yours. Go um, build your kingdom with it. I thought, this is mine, but I'm supposed to give it to you. So I reluctantly gave it to him. Time passed. We bought a house. Kids happened. And money was still tight. But Kim and I sat down and talked and prayed and decided, we're going to give our first fruits to God. He gets it first. And then we'll pay our bills with what's left, and we'll just see what happens. 
And this scripture came true. We always had enough. We still have enough. We have more than enough because we finally, because I'm hard-headed, decided that we're going to give back to God what's his in the first place and be faithful with it. He went first. Everything else was secondary. And as the scripture says, he was faithful. And that's been many, many years ago now. Um, but it's a leap of faith that I would encourage you all to take. And the way that I encourage young people to do this, don't pick a number, don't pick a dollar amount, don't pick a, or, you know, don't set it your standards too high. Pick something that you can cheerfully give. What's more important than the percentage or the dollar amount is your commitment, the commitment that you personally made to Christ. So go home and think about it, pray about it. If you have a spouse, talk to them about it, pray with them about it. Make a commitment between yourselves and God and stick to it. The number is not important. The commitment is. The number will change as your life changes, and your life will change because of the commitment. Now let me pull up all the other announcements. Okay, we got through that. And then um, let's go to the prayer slide. If you guys need prayer, we, we are a praying church. Our strategic plan, every facet of our strategic plan includes intentional prayer. And it's so important. Um, we all pray. We, you know, it's, it's a thing that is, becomes habit in our homes, I hope. But we're, we're talking about intentional prayer. Um, making it a point when you have a praise, when you have a concern, when you have something going on, and you just want somebody to pray with to be there for you. There's a QR code up here. You can take a picture of that. We also have prayer cards in the back. Fill out all the information and, and let us know if you want it to be private or public. And we will be praying for you, with you, however you choose for that to go. Um, this whole church is a praying church. I, I can tell you that. We do a lot of it um, together and apart. Um, so please put your requests in so that we can we can honor those. Women's Bible study twice a week. So Monday mornings at 10 here at the church. Wednesday evenings at 6.30 also here at the church. Today at 1 o'clock, um, we will have Oikos Membership 101 with Sean. He'll talk about what it means to be a member here. Um, answer any questions you may have. I would strongly encourage you to, to come. It's very informal. Nobody's going to put you on the spot. It's just so you'll have some information moving forward as to the next steps. Um, there's going to be more May 7th, August 6th, and November 5th. Or if you just need to meet with somebody about it, let Sean or one of the elders know and we'll make it happen. Como Christian Men's Conference happens Saturday, March 4th. If you're interested, let an elder know. We don't really have a sign-up sheet or anything. We're just trying to gauge interest and see how we move forward with that at this point. And then we have the Missouri Christian Convention coming up March 10th and 11th um, at the Lodge of the Four Seasons. Their website's on the slide. Um, we, in, we do intend to set up a, a sign-up sheet for that eventually so that we can figure out what our next steps are logistically. Highly encourage you if you can go to go. Sean, you're looking at me like you had something to add. Nope, nope. Totally misinterpreted that here. Let me try now. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, if you're interested in that, I highly encourage you to go. I think um, Dr. Gary is going to be there this year, right, Brad? Is Who is one of the three leaders of E2 who, who we have partnered with to help us with a lot of stuff. You'll see a lot of the, the elder training that we go through and a lot of the things, um, the Leadwell um, convention that we're headed to at the end of March is he's part of that so he and I can tell you he was here to help us with our three-year strategic plan he's a phenomenal guy a great leader great communicator so if you can make it I would encourage you to do that so if you stand with me we'll pray and we'll have one more song Heavenly Father I thank you for this day and this opportunity to come to your house to be with your people and to feel your love I pray as we leave this place today, we take your words to heart, as, as we asked earlier, that we examine ourselves, examine our lives, and uh, make a determination today that uh, we are going to follow you as you've asked, that we're going to put things down, um, that we're going to step away that, from our distractions, and that we're going to do the things that you've called us to do, to be your hands and feet, and to share your love with this community. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.